In this segment, we're going to talk about the male sexual body and we're going to focus in on the external structures. I saw this picture on Facebook a number of years ago and I thought it was pretty funny because it's actually a dog. Taken, <laughs> the picture was taken from the top, but it kind of looks like a penis, doesn't it? Penis and testicles. So um, I thought that was a pretty good warm up to our topic um, to look at the fuzzy penis. Okay, so let's move on to an actual penis. Um, well, a drawing of an actual penis. So here we have part of the penis. We're not seeing the full shaft part, but we're seeing like all the critical um, components of the penis. And uh, you can see that this person's fingers are pulling back one of the structures of the penis. So let's go through um, the, the structures of the penis, starting with the shaft. So part of this is obscured in a typical penis. There's going to be more and it's going to be attached to the body. Um, the part that is basically straight is considered the penile shaft. We'll look inside in a little bit and see what causes the penile shaft to become erect. But for right now, we'll just say that's the part that, you know, most noticeably gets erect. Um, so the next structure is what the fingers in this picture are pulling back and it's called the foreskin. And the foreskin in a, an unerect penis or what we call a flaccid penis is um, going to cover the head of the penis and protect it from friction and things like that. It kind of keeps the head of the penis more moist, which can be an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on what you're talking about. Um, in some people, the foreskin is removed and in other people, the foreskin is present. Uh, the edge of the head of the penis is called the corona, which in this era of coronavirus has taken on a new mean, but hopefully you guys have figured out why the coronavirus is called the coronavirus. It's got um, crown-like structures protruding from its viral body. And um, so whoever named the corona of the penis was saying that this is the crown of the penis. It's basically the edge of what people typically call the head of the penis. Scientifically, we call it the glands of the penis. Um, but it's that ridge around the base of the, of the head of the penis. And it comes up to sort of a triangular shape here. You can kind of, see, I don't know if you can see my, um, my mouse when I point with it, but I'm going to point with the mouse and gesture at this sort of triangular place along the um, corona. And so you have like this pronounced edge on the corona. And then when it comes together in this, in this sort of point, that edge sort of flattens out a little bit. Um, so that's, that's what's called the corona. Um, it's one of the most sensitive areas of the penis. It has the most densely packed nerve endings. Um, and then also very sensitive area of the penis would be the frenulum. And th that's this structure in this uncircumcised person, the frenulum really extends up in a person who's circumcised. It's still present. It just doesn't go all the way up to this, you know, the part of the skin that's been removed. Um, now you have a, you have frenula in lots of places on your body. You have a frenulum under your tongue you have a frenula um, on your bottom lip connecting it to the gums and on your top lip connecting it to the gums. So frenulum just means, you know, this sort of stretchy skin part and um, it's not unique to the penis. The penile glands is the large um, head of the penis. Um, you know, scientifically we call the corona something separate from the glands, but I think in practice, a lot of people think of them as just sort of all one structure. Um, but the, the corona is distinct in the sense that it does have more um, nerve endings per square inch than the, than the overall glands does. And the glands has more nerve endings per square inch than the shaft does. So um, general, in general, the head of the penis is much more sensitive than the shaft and the edge of the head of the penis is the most sensitive area. And then in the center, we have the urethra, which is the hole where urine passes and also where semen passes during ejaculation. And we'll be talking about all of these things that I'm kind of blowing by kind of fast. We'll be talking about them in more detail um, as we're going along. All right. So I wanted to talk about some sort of it, penis issues. I put it in quotation marks because I don't know, you know, what other word to use. So I used issues. Um, one big issue regarding penises is circumcision, whether the foreskin should be removed or not. Um, in some um, religious practices, it's not even a question. This is just what we do, and it's part of a religious perspective. 
Um, for other people, it's not a religious thing. And it's it then becomes more of, is there a health benefit? Like, is there a benefit to being circumcised? And so I thought I'd um, share with you maybe sort of the, the, the pros and the cons of circumcision. Um, usually it's performed on the first day of life. In modern American hospitals, they're doing more um, often a couple of days after birth. Um, I think it has to do with billing more than anything else, because if they perform the circumcision in the hospital, they may forget to bill for it. And um, so it's kind of for them financially easier to just have it performed at the first well baby checkup, which is two days after birth. Um, so usually first day of life and actually probably best to be done the first day of life, but it's in practice here in the U S become more common to be on the second or third day of life. Um, but it's still, it's being conducted on a very small baby. And so there are some concerns about it, right? So I thought I'd give you some of the pros and the cons. And I collected all of these, um, pros and cons from a giant review of the literature that was conducted by Burgu and his colleagues, um, in 2010. And they sort of compiled all of the things that um, research has shown us that can be advantageous about circumcision and that also can be disadvantageous about circumcision. So let's start with the benefits. There are a lot of studies. I was trying to quantify in my mind how many, but there are, I'll just say, you know, more than a dozen studies that have shown that partners of men who are circumcised have fewer urinary tract infections than partners of men who are uncircumcised. And it takes us back to when I mentioned that the foreskin helps to keep the glands of the penis moist. And that can be good, right? Because it helps to keep, you know, it lubricated for, you know, skin health and things like that. But it also gives this perfect, moist, warm, anaerobic um, place for bacteria to grow. And so then that bacteria can be delivered to the urethra of a sex partner, um, especially female sex partners who have shorter urethras. So it's easier for the bacteria to work their way up into the bladder and cause urinary tract infections. Um, urinary tract infections can be a huge problem. Um, they can be, you know, just an, a, a nuisance where, you know, you're having to um, urinate frequently and painful urination and things like that, that, you know, for some sufferers can be cured with, you know, cranberry juice or other kinds of sort of home-based remedies. But if you have the type of urinary infection that's not responding to these simpler treatments um, and you have to take antibi antibiotics for it um, and you don't f fully clean, clear the infection, you can end up with a, a urinary tract infection that is um, antibiotic resistant and you can have long-term significant impacts up to and including the loss of the kidneys. Um, or even death. And so it's not like a small thing. Sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, that's no big deal. You just take some antibiotics, but um, antibiotics don't always completely clear it. And you can end up with a person who's significantly harmed from urinary tract infections. Um, if a person is circumcised, they tend to contract fewer STIs of all sorts. Um, STIs, that's short for sexually transmitted infections. We'll be talking about that later in another chapter. Um, but there are different kinds of um, STIs. They're the bacterial ones. And um, men who are circumcised uh, absolutely catch fewer of those kinds. Those bacterial infections tend to be picked up through um, you know, contact with infected vaginal secretions or semen. Um, and so when you don't have the, the foreskin, there isn't the, uh, there's a reduced likelihood that a person would pick up um, bacteria from a partner and then give it a perfect incubation place called the, un, you know, the, the area behind the corona that is covered by the foreskin. It's like this perfect place for things to grow. And so bacterial infections are lower. And then also viral infections are lower among men who are circumcised. And so they are less likely to contract herpes, um, less likely to contract HIV. Um, now it's not a perfect, it's absolutely not a perfect protection against those things, but they have a lower rate of contracting those things. And in the flip side, they are less likely to give it to a partner. Um, so they're less likely to have it behind that foreskin and then deliver it to a partner. 
And so um, one of the treatments for HIV around the world has been circumcision. Now, it's really important to think about the difference between circumcision conducted as a baby infant versus a person who gets circumcised in adulthood. Um, that's a completely different process. So we're talking here about circumcision of infants. Um, in an adult, the, the healing is different. The pain is different. Um, the loss of sensation is different because in an adult, the scar tissue is going to be more extensive and, and going to contribute to a loss of sensation that with an infant, you're not going to have. Um, so we're talking here, um, these benefits are um, conveyed to people who have been circumcised. And generally, you're going to have these benefits being um, most pronounced, you know, they're, they're going to outweigh the deficits most heavily when it's conducted in infancy. Some of the concerns we have about circumcision, some people just say it is absolutely mutilation. This baby was born perfectly fine. This is how um, his penis was designed. Why would you cut something off? And people who think that it's mutilation oftentimes point to, um, you know, the reduced UTIs and the fewer STIs. Those things can be outweighed. You know, you can, be, you can correct for those problems by good hygiene. And so if you have a a person who pulls back their foreskin and washes thoroughly and washes regularly, um, and especially washes after they have contact with somebody else, right? Any kind of sexual contact should be followed by, um, you know, cl cleansing the area anyway. Um, and absolutely, if there's a foreskin present, it should be followed by cleansing. And so if you follow those normal hygiene pra practices, then you're not going to need to remove the, the foreskin. And so now we're left with, it's just mutilation. It's just removing a part of the body that doesn't need to be removed. Um, others, you know, concerns are that, you know, anytime you have any kind of surgery, there's a risk. There's a risk of, of uncontrolled bleeding. There's a risk that too much might be removed. And then you end up with a penis that can't become erect without tearing the skin. Um, you know, that there, there are problems that can, clots can form and that can cause, you know, embolism that goes to the lungs or the heart, right? Like it, there are these problems. Now these risks from surgery tend to be larger for the, the older we get. And so if we were to perform circumcision on an adult, we'd have more of these risks than if we were to con, um, conduct it on a, an infant. Um, but there are enough cases of babies whose circumcision was, they call it botched, right? Where, where something went wrong during the circumcision and now their penis is not functional, things like that. There are enough cases of that to really scare a lot of parents and say, hmm, it is not worth it. Um, there are too many risks versus the benefits, right? Um, and then there's the big issue that a lot of people have been bandying about lately that it, um, it, it produces reduced sensitivity. Um, I want to first off remind you, like I said on the last, uh, while I was talking about benefits, I am only talking about um, men who are tested in this study. All the men in the study that I'm going to report were tested as adults and they were circumcised as babies. So uh, I have read lots of studies where they've looked at um, men who got circumcised as adults for different reasons. It might have been because they had uh, their foreskin has adhered to their glands. And so now they, the skin has basically welded together. And so they have to have the foreskin removed in order to make their penis functional again. Um, sometimes men will have circumcision in adulthood because they converted to a religion that requires circumcision. Um, sometimes men will get circumcised as adults because they have had um, recurring STIs and their doctor has recommended that this would help them to avoid it. Um, there are a lot of different reasons why men might get circumcised as adults. Some of them like are super demanding, like your foreskin is welded to your glands. We have to do this. Um, other times it's more like this will help you to, to get around the problems that you've been having. Um, so I want to keep the men who are circumcised, right? Circumcised as adults as a separate issue, because um, like I said, Typically, when you have a surgery conducted when you're an adult, you're more likely to grow scar tissue that could imp have an impact on sensitivity and other kinds of things um, that are different from what happens when you're an infant and you basically um, can heal without scars and, and things like that. So 
The study that I'm going to report comes from Sorrells et al. Um, in 2007. And I'm going to make the picture a little bit bigger for us. Okay, so this is a really interesting study. Uh, I don't know who who uh, came up with the idea or who got the short straw and had to do the actual um, touching. But so the idea in this study was that they had a device that is, um, it's metal, but it's got a, a blunt tip. And it's connected to a machine that detects how much pressure is being exerted on the tip of the, of the <laughs> I want to call it a probe. I'm not sure what the correct term for what we're, what this device is called, but it's a, it's a little, it looks like a pen basically and they can touch the man in different places on the penis the machine will detect how much pressure is being exerted and the man's job is to say when he feels the pressure and so he's looking in a different direction and he says i feel it when he feels it and so what the bars are representing is how much pressure that's on the y-axis how much pressure was exerted in order for the man to say he feels it at different places along the penis. So um, point one is where they're actually touching the urethra, the opening where urine passes. So we're going through these different areas of the penis. And um, what I'd like you to get, the part, of, part of the reason why I didn't bother to put the legend where it shows exactly where is being touched is that what I wanted you to get first off is just this global pattern where you're seeing that, um, it doesn't even matter which bars were like who is which bar really because whether they're in the white group or they're in the gray group um, you see that those bars are very similar in height at most positions right you see a, a couple of positions where the gray bar is just completely absent and i'll talk about that in a sec and you see one place where the white bar is a little taller at position 17 you see one place where the um, the white bar is taller than the gray bar, which means it took more pressure for people in the, in the white group to detect it than it took the people in the gray bar. Oh, you see one other place, point position 10, where it's a little taller, but I'd put um, positions six through 11. I would say there's no significant difference between the two groups as far as sensitivity, actually through um, position 12. So from six to 12, there's, it looks like those are very similar responses. Um, position one, very similar responses. Position 17, it looks like um, the gray bar group is a little bit more sensitive. Like that looks like a noticeable difference. They, they are responding to the stimulation earlier than the white group is. Um, so, the play, so now I will reveal that the white bar is the uncircumcised men and the gray bar is the circumcised men. And um, so the fact that there's really no sensitivity at most, no difference in sensitivity at most positions and in fact, the one place where it's significantly different is where the, circum the uncircumcised men take more pressure to detect that stimulus, which means they're less sensitive. It kind of takes away the argument that there's more sensitivity. Um, some people, the, the argument is that, that uh, men who are uncircumcised, because the glands of their penis is covered, and so it doesn't get rubbed on by their clothing or just incidental contact, that they may maintain greater sensitivity in the glands of their penis. And so they'll be enjoying more pleasure in sexual contact than people who are circumcised and have become a little desensitized to stimulation on their, the glands of their penis. Um, I think this graph re reveals that that's probably not true. Um, the middle, um, when we look at positions six through 12, that's actually stimulating the glands. And so you can see that there's not a significant difference in sensitivity um, between the circumcised and the uncircumcised men in these different positions on the glands. Now you'll notice positions two through five and then 13 through 16, the gray bars are not um, present. And that's because we're te testing areas that relate to the foreskin. Um, and so when, okay, positions two through five are when they're sticking the probe under the foreskin while it is actually covering the gland. So they're like slipping the probe under the foreskin and touching areas that normally with the foreskin present would be covered. Um, and on 13 through 16, they're touching the outside of the foreskin. So some people have looked at this chart and said, well, I mean, look at position three, it takes like zero touching 
for the person to recognize that they're being touched. So it's a very sensitive area. I mean, 13 and 14, those are very, you know, low pressure and they're responding. And so some people have said, uh, you know, that's, you know, the parts that the, that the uncircumcised person doesn't have are actually the most sensitive parts. Well, it looks like that. It does look like that. <laughs> if obviously, because you are more responsive in the very areas that the foreskin is involved in, but it's that should not be construed as meaning that the foreskin is the most sensitive part of the of the penis because it's not the most. Sen- and how do we know that for sure? Um, it has to do with how many nerves are serving that area. So the most densely packed nerve area is the glands and the, and really especially within that the corona and that's those things are obviously present in both um, circumcised and uncircumcised men the reason why the the uncircumcised men look so sensitive in those areas um, one through five and 13 through 16 is because they are being touched in areas that um, are okay usually not touched in that way. I don't know how to phrase this very well. Um, uh, The only analogy I can give all of us, we all have a structure that we can all touch and have a similar experience. And that is our belly buttons, right? Um, When you stick your finger inside your belly button, it's very sensitive because it's partly because it's an area that is not usually touched, right? Like that's not usually something that you probe around in and touch. And usually the, the penis is not, usually you don't stick a probe underneath the foreskin and uh, come in contact with the junction between the shaft and the foreskin. Like that's not usually something that's done. And so it's very sensitive. Um, you kind of have to hold the foreskin in place in order to even achieve the goal, right? Of trying to touch that area. Um, and so you're having to sort of warn the person that they're about to be touched because you're having to hold things in place. And so there's a lot of confounds present in this test of how sensitive um, the foreskin is. I think the one thing that we can objectively say is that there are are not very many nerves that serve the foreskin. And so the removal of the foreskin itself does not deprive a man of like the most sensitive part of his penis. Um, I actually read a blog post where somebody was arguing against circumcision based on this exact study and their the blogger's conclusion that the sensitivity displayed at especially position three um, indicated that we're when with circumcision we are depriving a man of his most sensitive part of his penis and that's not actually what this is showing Um, this is showing that they recognize that they're being touched with a lot less pressure at at position three but that doesn't mean that that structure um, alone that the foreskin is the reason for that sensitivity so um, it's, I think really you can see that from my discussion of what some people have said about this graph versus what other people have said about this graph, that this is clearly a, a, a topic for debate, right? This is not something that you can clearly say, I've Googled everything and I, I can prove to you that this or that is the better thing to do for an infant boy. Um, I don't think that that's something that that's probably possible. That's why in my little scale that I, I depicted, um, I have an equal number of, of things under the benefits as there is under the concerns. Because the problem with this topic is that there is no clear cut answer. If a person has, you know, religious convictions that make the decision clear, that's, that's a different thing. But for a person who doesn't have those convictions, it really is up to the parents to sort of figure out for them and for their baby and for what they, you know, how well they think their baby's going to be able to take care of, you know, you got to think about the first 18 years of life, just as much as you think about the rest of the adult's life and think, okay, how well are they really going to maintain this area? And, um, you know, those kinds of factors and make decisions based on personal, like what I think is likely to happen for us and our family and what we value in us and our family. Um, And so this is one of those areas of human sexuality where it's super important for individuals to formulate their own, um, you know, values, their own sexual philosophy. Um, You know, what does this topic mean for a person who maybe one day is going to have a baby boy and have to make this decision? Um, So um, some, some parents have decided, well, we'll wait and let the boy decide for himself. As he gets older, he can decide for himself. Um, That's actually kind of, you know, not probably the best strategy in the sense that um, 
you know, it's much worse for an adult man to have a circumcision than it is for a baby boy to have a circumcision. So if a family is thinking that it's something that they want done, it's best to do it when it's easiest for the baby to recover from it and to have full functioning and everything to go right. Um, And so it it makes it even worse because then there's like this time-based pressure for parents to, to decide while they're, you know, while they're pregnant with a baby boy, right? And they have to kind of decide what are we doing on day one or day three. Um, and it's a lot of pressure on parents. So it's not clearly mutilation like we're going to talk about with female genital mutilation because there are benefits um, that are medical. There are rationales. There are um, like logical reasons. It doesn't deprive men of their sexual functioning. It doesn't it's not intended to do that to to their sexual functioning. And so that's completely different than what we're going to talk about with female genital mutilation, which has no purpose except for to control female sexuality. Um, So, you know, if, if female circumcision, which they actually have a type of mutilation called female circumcision, if it, if it helped to protect women from bladder infections or um, from STDs or something, we would have a different conversation about it. But but none of the female mutilations do anything to benefit the women and in fact, create enormous health problems in most women who experience them. So um, completely different topic. And so it's up to families to decide what they want for their little boys. So on that happy note, I think it's a really good place to take a break and we will come back in the next um, section and we'll talk about another penis issue, penis size. Hopefully it'll be a lighter conversation. 